On behalf of everyone at WNET, congratulations to Steve Adubato and the Caucus Educational Corporation on 25 great years of broadcasting. Hi, I'm Bernie Flynn. At New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Company, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Hackensack University Health Network, Sun National Bank, New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. United Water, making the planet sustainable is the best job on earth. County College of Morris, connecting learning and life. The Merck Company Foundation, and by Fedway Associates, Inc. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com, everything Jersey and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. You see, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. More important, I'm coming to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. I'm sorry, but we'll just continue to do this because right now uh, we have on the set Corey Michael Smith. He's an actor. He's at breakfast at Tiffany's uh, on Broadway playing at the Court Theater. How are you doing? Yes, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. The reason you threw me off, right, threw me off is we were talking about the fact that at breakfast at <laughs> Tiffany's, uh, originally Truma Capote, right? Yes. And yes, the yes. role that you play is Fred. Fred. And he is? He's the narrator of the play. And uh, a Southern writer. And a Southern writer. A la... Truman Capote. Now, the re reason we were laughing here is because <laughs> you have a Southern accent in... In the show, yeah. I use That's a Southern not possible. Dialect. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I actually... The last, the last four plays I've done, I've had a dialect. New Hampshire, British. Right. Uh, Midwestern, Iowa. Right. And now Southern. Now, I told you I'm from New Jersey. Yeah. Can you pull off a Jersey accent? Well... Uh, one of my agents, well, the first time, the first time that I met him, I I said, "Where are you from?" Because he was talking to Sarah. Hey, Sarah, I said to my other agent. Well, was you were like, just making fun of the way he said Sarah. I, I wasn't making fun of it. I was like, "Where are you from?" And everybody laughed in the room. He's like, "I'm from Jersey." <laughs> it's kind of great. No, dialects are awesome. It's it, for me. It's the easiest way to, uh, you know, verbally start a character. But you around. heard Sarah differently, didn't Sarah. you? Sarah, Sa, Ah, Ara. <laughs> Sarah. Oh, Georgette is getting irritated with me. She's like, tell us about the show. Because <laughs> we can do dialects all day. You do a Bronx? No, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> tell us about Breakfast at Tiffany's. Breakfast oh, at who's Tiffany's. in your cast? You have some pretty talented people in the cast. Yeah. Uh, Co-starring with me is Amelia Clark from Game of Thrones. She's terrific. On HBO. She is terrific. There she is right there. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Amelia you is... You couldn't find an attractive co-star? <laughs> Isn't she awful? Yeah, yeah, she's it's, terrible. It's really unfortunate. The genetics. Ah, oh, terrible, her. terrible. Um, she is lovely and stunning and sweet, and it's pretty easy to fall in love with her every night. Yes, and she has a great accent too. She does. Um, she has a British accent because yes. she's British. And the other guy who's uh, very hot in this is uh, George. Mr. George Went. He's hot. He is. He's otherwise Sexy known as. Man. And cheers, Norm. Norm. Yeah, he walks in. My first, my first line in the play to him is Joe because his name's Joe Bell. And I was tempted the first day of the rehearsal to just kind of holler out, and I, it's inappropriate to the scene, but to give him Still a la, yeah, a la cheers, uh, an old, an old uh, shout of Joe. For those who do not know the breakfast at uh, Tiffany's storyline, just set it up a little bit for people. Yeah, well, most people are going to know the film. Right. How's it different? It's quite different. Uh, the film was sanitized, if you will, for uh, the time that it was produced and for Hollywood. Um, so they changed things a little bit. Holly Golightly, the character isn't quite as dark or uh, outgoing. She's not as, as clearly a prostitute call girl as she is in the novella. Every man wants to be with Holly. Yes. And every woman wants to... And every woman, frankly. Wants to be wants, with Holly. Wants to be with Holly or, <laughs> or be Holly. She does say in the play, she's like, 
She talks about being a dyke, and she does say dyke. That's that's not We're my term. We're on public television. I'm sorry. Well, I guess, I guess I you can say, say that. It is yes. it is in the play. That's why no, I'm. No, yeah, but you can. But she talks about you know being a lesbian. And yes. She's like, well, of course I'm a, I'm a little bit of a lesbian. Everyone is a little bit. So what? <laughs> um, and so there's nothing that's very sanitized in the play. No, it's it's just earnest to what Capote intended. Um, so essentially, what the what the story is doing, it's I I take the audience. I start in 1957. Uh, I visit Joe Bell, who's George Went, uh, and he's called me over to the bar because of Holly. I find out she's not back in town. I, there was just a picture of of a statue that looks like her. I take from that, she's like pressed back in my mind, and I take everyone back to 1943 mm. and share with the audience my short relationship with Holly. And so it's essentially a love story that's born of longing because uh, she's no longer in my life and I have no way of contacting her. And so it's, uh, I was drawn to the story. You were really drawn to it? Because it's incredibly sad. It's really sad. No, I kind of love the idea of this man, 14 years, uh, going have, for 14 years. Pining. Pining over this woman, this enigmatic, ebullient lady that he cannot stop obsessing over or loving mm. so much that he, you know, every night I get to, like, tell my story of her. And thank God Amelia is <laughs> lovable because I would, my job would be so much harder if she was not. So it's not that hard. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's easy to love. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is your Broadway debut. It is. Describe your career up into this. Uh, it's, it's been predominantly theater. I graduated from college three and a half years ago and moved. You too? Me too. Really? Oh my god. <laughs> Same age. That's See? Cool. Is it crazy? Uh, yeah. Um, so I'm, I moved here three and a half years ago. Uh, and did I you can't. know this was it? Okay, let me put it the other way. When did you know that this was what you wanted to do? Uh, that you wanted to act and you wanted to act in theater and you wanted to act ultimately on Broadway? When did you know? How young were you? Um, this, wasn't, this wasn't like a, a definitive choice for me. Uh, you know, th th we hear all the time, we heard through college, if, if this is, the only way to be an actor is, this is if this is the only thing that you could ever do, the only thing you could ever see yourself doing, because it's just that hard to survive this industry. And I always heard that, and I, I understood at least the degree of the passion that you had to have to pursue this, the intensity and like the devotion, the fortitude, whatever. Uh, but what I never understood, I have so many other interests. And so I came to the city very determined to like give this my A effort. Uh, but with the understanding that there's a certain kind of career that I want and that I'm willing to have. And I told myself if, if I don't feel like that's in my future, if that's not what was, going, what was happening, there are plenty of other things that I find Incredibly exciting. You know, any actors want to, are very upset with you right now? No, no, it's, but you know, I think it's why I like acting is because I get to study a bunch of different things. Every time I take on a new role, it's a new person that has new interests, that has a new occupation, profession. I, I kind of like the idea of this ever changing route of study. It's like, it's like constantly being in university. You love it, but you're not living and dying for it. I absolutely do. I, I, I spend, I spend all day, every day. No, 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 no. I didn't mean that in terms of working hard. Oh, no, I didn't mean that at all. But acting. But you didn't go into this saying, "I have to do this, or my life isn't going to be valuable." I mean, you, you no. Just... What was most important to me was uh, in college. I, I almost dropped out of acting a couple of times because I wanted to make sure that what I was doing was something extremely worthwhile. Mm. You know, my my issue with going in, I. I I had trouble deciding an occupation or a career because I didn't know the best way that I could contribute myself in, in a way that I'd be fulfilled and actually feel like I'm making a difference or, or participating in the world in a positive and an influential way. How the heck did you get this healthy? Parents? I don't know. <laughs> Where'd Maybe. you grow up? Ohio. Okay. Columbus, Ohio. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's good stuff. No, so, you know, it, I mean. It's making a lot of sense. No, but I, you know, it's like I, I didn't. I I like doing meaningful theater. Uh, up until this point, I've done some more risque pieces. This is pretty. This is more along the lines of being traditional and classic for me, uh, in terms of my interests. But I love 
the history of this, and that's why I'm kind of drawn. We to plug this it point. one more time. Breakfast yeah. at Tiffany's. Um, Corey Michael Smith. Uh, where can it be seen at the Court? Court Theater. You know where it is exactly? It's on 48th Street, just uh, east of Times Square. I just want to test you, Corey. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining yeah. us. Thanks for having me, man. Stay tuned. Uh, Steve Adubara from the Tish WNET Studios at Lincoln Center. We'll be right back right after this. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. That was a scene from uh, Kinky Boots playing on Broadway, and uh, right now you're looking at Stark Sands, Tony Award-nominated uh, Broadway actor who uh, stars in Kinky Boots. How you doing? I'm pretty great. Describe uh, Kinky Boots. We uh, just had Daryl on, who uh, runs yeah. the show there. Um, talk to us about Kinky Boots, the role you play, and why it's so significant. Kinky Boots is a story about a, a shoe factory in Northampton, which is north of London, outside of the city. and. Um, the factory is, is going out of business, and my character, Charlie Price, reluctantly inherits the factory from his dad, uh, who passes away at the top of the show. It's not something that Charlie ever wanted to do, but he's stuck doing it. And in the process to try to find a way to save the factory and all of the people he's grown up with from losing their jobs, and, and really the, the whole town from going under, he meets a drag queen named Lola, who is complaining about how they don't make sturdy drag boots for, for men. He's always wearing women's boots that are falling apart and heels are breaking. So, uh, yeah. Is that? That's Charlie and Lola. That's and, Lola. And, and the eventual kinky boots that they make together. Um, you're, you're creating a niche over there, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, that, that's the idea is that um, nobody else is making these boots the right way. And so Charlie try, has to convince his, his fellow factory workers that this is the direction to go to save the factory. And there's a little bit of pushback at first, but once everybody gets on board, it's, um, it's a really special show. It's got a great message of acceptance and believing in yourself and finding your passion. And um, it happens every night for us on stage. Tell folks where the uh, play can be seen. At the Al Hirschfeld Theater on 45th Street mm. and 8th Avenue. Your uh, entry into the world of acting, when did you know that you wanted to perform on stage or screen or in any way connected to acting? I did a production of The Sound of Music when I was a freshman in high school. And Where was this? In, in Highland Park High School in Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas? Yeah. And A hotbed of theater activity, no? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> no, nobody in my family does this. <laughs> nobody has done this. But I, I don't know. It's just something I tried and I was good at it. And I, 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 was, I feel so lucky that I found something I was good at. And I played the, the youngest Von Trapp child, Kurt. I had one line. It was, I'm incorrigible. You know, that's all, that, that was it. And I was, you know, I had already had a growth spurt, so I was taller than all the other kids, but I was the young, you know, it was very funny. Right. But, um, yeah, I just caught the bug. And I, I, I became that guy in my high school who was the one who was in everything. You were the guy. Yeah. And, and of course, that's sort of a big fish in a small pond situation but I uh, was accepted into USC's Bachelor of Fine Arts program for college, and then I became, you know, a very, it was a very different pond and a much different size of fish, but um, I stayed in LA. I started working in film and television and was very lucky right off the bat. And then in 2007, I came to New York and another, caught another great break and played uh, the role of Lieutenant Raleigh in, in a revival of Journey's End, which went on to win the Tony for Best Revival. And for me, that's where that, that nomination came in and it changed my life. How? All of a sudden I had, you know, I, I spent seven years in LA working in film and television and I chipped away, but I didn't get to like a place where I got a huge break. 
And in one job on Broadway, I became a Tony-nominated actor who all of a sudden was in demand, you know? So to the Tony-nominated actor thing, brand, does matter a lot. I mean, it doesn't For really, you, it did. I, I don't want to say it matters a lot. It, it makes things happen. Well, you said it changed your life. That matters a lot. Okay. But, you know, to me, I, I feel like it's, it's a, it was a hugely lucky thing that happened to me. <laughs> and it's, give, it's given me a lot of great opportunities. Um, you earned it. I don't, I don't rate people by those things. And I don't rate actors whether they're Tony nominated or not because there can only be so many every year. And I'm one of the lucky ones. And so people reached out for you, like Jerry Miller, who is uh, a great director? Jerry right. Mitchell, yes. Right. Jerry, um, yeah, this is one of those things where I didn't audition for Kinky Boots, really. I got they a, came after, they went after you? Yeah, um, I had some fans. You're looking at Jerry Mitchell right there? Yes, that's And me. that's Lola, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. Billy Porter who plays Lola. And they want, what is it like when, it's interesting, what is it, I think about this, when a very well-known director says, we want you, that's gotta feel awesome. It does, it feels really good. And it's not, it doesn't happen that much. So when it, when it does, you, you've gotta pay attention to it. And mm. when, of course, when I heard that it was, you know, uh, Harvey Firestein writing the book and Cindy Lauper writing the music and Daryl Roth producing, it was, you know, I couldn't really, I couldn't really say no. I, at first, there was a conflict, so I couldn't do it the first. The Scheduling first, conflict. Yeah, I was, I was working in American Idiot at the time and I'd already taken another, another um, workshop on the side, so I couldn't do the first reading, but they were very persistent and managed to get me. Now, obviously, as a very young man uh, in this business who's been able to work um, and now is doing what you're doing with these terrific people, um, and you're hot right now, I imagine for a lot of other folks who, particularly younger people, young, even younger than you, or, your, or contemporaries who come to you and ask, for advice. Is that a tough spot for you? Yeah. How so? <clears throat> I think that um, I don't have the answers. I have my own process. And for example, the advice that I've given is to just be really prepared when, you, when the opportunities come. I, I've been in an audition room before, and this is more in LA than in New York, but I've been in auditions rooms, audition rooms before where I have gone in and done all of my prep, I've made all of my choices, I know, I know the script, I don't really need to look down at the pages in my hand, but I hold them for security. And I will see guys and say, hey, you know, hey, what's up, and catch up with them, and then five minutes before they're called in, they'll say, give me a second, I haven't even looked at this yet, and they will <sighs> take it out of an envelope and look at it, and I'll just think, you're, you're wasting your time. But I, I don't want to share that with too many people because it seems to be a, a kind of, I don't know, a good secret. It's gotten me a lot of work. Well, the secret what? To be prepared before you go in? Some people just don't think about it. They think, oh, I'm allowed to read it off the page. This is cold. But it's, it gets you so much farther if you know what you're doing. Yeah. If it's, you know it's, what you're... It's true in your business. It's true in our business. Yeah. It's true in every business. It, it sounds simple, but it's so true. Uh, I'll give you uh, one more opportunity, even though we're PBS. We'll give you a chance again to plug. Oh, uh, plug. Yeah, plug your, plug your, plug your play, plug uh, so everyone knows uh, where to find it. Well, Kinky Boots is a fantastic show about acceptance and passion and believing in yourself and allowing others to be themselves. It's at the Hirschfeld Theater on 45th Street, and it's running from now until as long as we can run. And it's a family play. Everyone pretty much can see it. I think so. I mean, it, it, the, the title "Kinky Boots" uh, for people who don't know anything about it might no bad them, language might give them a misconception. No you bad know. language. Of course not. And there is no bad language in the show. Good. And it's a very powerful message, Stark Sands. Um, I want to thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Wish you nothing but the best. Thanks, Steve. Got it. Stay right there. Stay with us. This is one-on-one -on -one from the Tish WNET studios. We'll be back right after this. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org, visit us online at oneonone.org, or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. Kyan Krippendorf is the author of Outthink the Competition, How a New Generation of Strategists Sees Options Others Ignore. Good to see you, Kyan. Thanks, good to be here. Let's get to it uh, right away. You have uh, done some consulting for some pretty big companies mm -hmm. like Microsoft, Citigroup, and uh, Red Bull. Uh, I'll think the competition. Mm -hmm. Let's get right to some of the specific strategies we talk about. Uh, five habits of being an outthinker, outthinking the competition. One of the ones that I really drew, drew me right away is mental travel 
Mental time travel. I didn't grab this. I didn't yes. understand it right away. What does it it's mean? A, it's a habit that humans develop around the age of three. And what it simply means is that you travel forward in time and imagine a future. You know, innovative thinkers are willing to travel forward. Uh, the founder of Stanford University said, man cannot create what he cannot imagine. It's that, mm -hmm. that concept. It's like a chess player thinking 10 moves out. And, uh, and if you see great innovators, great politicians as well, you see that throughout the day they, mm -hmm. they, they stop and they imagine out and then they come back and they make their choice. But you call these people out thinkers. Yes. Before I should have uh, actually gone back and give you a, given you an opportunity to describe what an out thinker is before yes. we talk about the strategies. What is an out thinker? Well, I mean, my theory is that that innovators they see options that others don't see because they think outside of prevailing paradigms. That humans we want to stop thinking. We want to start repeating ourselves. You know, you've got a, you got a concept for uh, let's say a concept for a TV show and uh -huh. it works, right? And and how many TV shows just want to repeat and repeat and repeat? The idea is to stop thinking, doing yes. what works, right? And then the disruption comes when someone appears on the scene, this out thinker, and they think differently. They just have a different concept, different frame. And because they think differently, things come naturally to them that to the rest of us seem unorthodox. You know, it's so interesting in the world of public television, if you are not an out thinker, you will die. Yes. yes. I mean, because someone says, oh, I'm going to do public television the way it's been done for a really long time. Right. It doesn't work. Right. Even though public television is, is a great brand, mm -hmm. if you are not constant, all of us in it. Yes. I mean, connecting to the digital world or constantly finding new ways to bring in revenue or whatever it is. Yeah. And I don't care whether it's public television or the world of sports or a techno technological field, it doesn't matter. Yes. Saying I'm gonna stay the same status quo is not an option. Right, right. Well, for some people it is an option. There's Successful success game plan? Well, you, you no longer become an innovator. What I find is that innovative shows or companies or you know any products, they stop, they, they reach this state where they just want to protect what they've built. When you've been successful, then you're less likely to want to change. You just want to lock up something. Um, but you're right, it's not an option in that there's always the risk right. that the out thinker is going to appear and say, hey, I can do this differently, I can do this better. You know, a lot of your work comes from this, uh, this research and experience connected to the Eastern, if you will, military yes. orientation. Yes. How does that connect to American corporate culture? Um, so, you know, I've been doing this for about 12 years, and I've got this theory that's a little bit out there, but it works. Large companies, executives. Describe it. So the idea is here that humans make decisions based on telling themselves stories, that there are certain generic narratives they tell themselves. For example, one that's well known is the Trojan horse. So you might face a problem and say, oh, the Trojan horse, how could I do that here? Now those two words, Trojan horse, they pull, to, they pull up a, a very complex narrative of, I, you know, I, I put up something, they let me in, they don't know I'm there, but once I'm in the walls, then I can you know, expand. And the Trojan it, horse is fake. It's fake, right. It's a front. It's a front. So it's about a front that allows people to let you in. Now I interviewed um, Alexandra Kostinuk, she's the Raymond Women World's Chess Champion, and uh, she does this thing for promotional purposes. She'll line up 15 games and 15 people will play her and she will look at the board and she'll see the winning move, the winning move, and she'll repeat and she'll win all of these games. And you could be sitting across from her for 20 minutes thinking, what's Alexandra gonna do? And she, you, you won't see it. And yet like that, she sees it. And, and the reason that she can see the winning move is simply that she tells herself more, herself more stories than you do. We can remember seven things, seven plus or minus two things. So when we're solving a problem, if it's a simple problem, we only have seven possible options, then we can think it through. But in order to see the really innovative option, it's the hundredth option. How do you see a hundred options but, by telling yourself stories? But in the consulting and the coaching that you do, and you've been doing this for a long time, yeah. you've written many uh, books before. Here's my question. Do, how do most corporate executives and leaders respond when you tell them they have to have that many options and be that creative and innovative? Yes, I was, it's gotten much easier. Seven years ago, it was a little more difficult because large companies were large and stable, but now you're seeing these great big companies failing, falling. Yes. You know, the most innovative companies in the world today, the most uh, admired companies in the world today are Google and Apple and Amazon. If you looked back at that list over the last 15 years, it was really quite consistent, you know, with GE and Johnson Johnson and Microsoft, there's been a transformation and these large companies are really starting to fall. So now executives are starting to worry about, hey, the obvious options maybe aren't good enough. What do you mean when you say the really great companies, quote, act like water? 
They have to fill yeah. every space. What does that yeah. mean? Yeah, what it means is, and bringing it back to what you're saying, is that looking for every, uh, looking for every opportunity. Um, a, f a friend of mine at uh, Burger King, he said that they calculated and they estimate that Burger King makes about 10,000 strategic decisions a day. You've got thousands of people making lots of decisions every day that is determining your strategy and how innovative you're being. It's no longer the CEO saying, we will do these three things and then everyone else goes and executes it. It's, it's not the higher hierarchical, you know, down, yes. downward decision making. It can't be. Yes. Because because um, there are a lot of attackers coming because this, the competition decision, competition competition is accelerating. That you know it used to be that you could come up with a product or you could come up with a TV show and hey there were three networks. If you got on that network, you could just you know you hold your spot for years. Now we've got hundreds. So of we need everyone on this team yeah. doing what? Out thinking. Everyone being a strategist, everyone looking for those options, trying to play like Alexandra does. Give me one more uh, habit, we're running out of time. Yeah. Um, and one thing we haven't figured out is how to create more time. Mm -hmm. Give me one more habit of these outthinkers. Well, the habit that we just talked about was um, uh, uh, frame shifting, shifting your perspective. But another one I think is really important is a disruptive mindset. You know, Steve Jobs is famous for having said, I'm as proud of what we don't do as I am of what we do do. And what Steve Jobs and Apple were able to do is come up with these long list of possible things they could do. And then they could be really selective and say, hey, that's a great idea. I can see how customers would love that new device, but that's an idea that Samsung can copy next year. Because they have a longer list, they can be more selective and just choose the things that the competition will copy. Another way of looking at it is do what is truly uniquely you, that only you can do, that you'd be the best at doing, not something that another show or another company could turn on the next day. As opposed to the more we do, the more successful we yes, will do. Yes, right. Just do more. Customers will love it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And then you end up with thousands of products. Mm -hmm. Apple has... The book is called Outthink the Competition, How a New Generation of Strategists Sees Options Others Ignore. Kai and I want to thank you for joining us and letting us see other options that we often miss. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. Funding has been provided by Hackensack University Health Network, Sun National Bank, New Jersey Natural Gas, United Water, County College of Morris, the Merck Company Foundation, and by Fedway Associates, Inc. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. This healthcare message is brought to you by MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. Choosing a new family doctor can be confusing. Check with your health insurer to see which physicians near you participate with your plan. Find out which hospitals the doctor uses and who covers when the doctor is away. And remember to schedule an appointment with your new doctor in advance to fill out any paperwork without the added stress of being sick.